life in all generations forever and ever. Amen. Hey, good morning. Okay. That's really nice. Bobby, Bobby, can we go to garden? Yeah. Yeah. Bobby, Bobby, I need to go to garden. Okay, okay. All right. Well, welcome to church. My name is Jerry. Are you glad you're here today? Yeah. Tell you, I'd rather be here than the best hospital in the nation. Amen. And if you're watching online across the nation and around the world, welcome. We want to welcome you into the, into the, uh, to your front room or wherever you're watching us. If you're ever in the Fruitland Park area, stop on by. We'll make you feel right at home. Well, did you have a good New Year's? Everybody safe? Praise God. Nobody got arrested. You know who I'm looking at. <laughs> you know, one of the things about a computer, remember Y2K? Y2K, everybody was scared because they thought the computers were going to reset. And so people were stockpiling all kinds of stuff. And maybe you still have stuff that you stockpiled back 24 years ago. <laughs> and uh, it was people were buying weapons and ammo. And it was like, oh, the world's going to come to an end. And guess what happened? Nothing. That's right. I want to talk to you about today about um, some things about computers. Besides the computer, re the computer messing up on Y2K, my computer will mess up a lot if I have a lot of um, applications open. Same with my phone. Have you noticed that? Where it starts slowing down and you think you send a message and it doesn't send a message, or you go like, "How come I'm not getting any any re, um, um, replies on my emails?" And you realize it got stuck. And the reason that it was is because your computer is bogged down. And what you need to do is to close out all of those open uh, applications, and then you need to restart your computer. And once you restart the computer, it now has its full computing power. And I think in our lives, we need to have a time of reset. Because in our, we live complicated lives. I thought the older I get, the less complicated it would get. <laughs> Quite the opposite. Now I have to remember doctor's appointments. I have to remember all these kinds of things. I never had to work. I have to call, you know, your, your, your money guy. You got to call. You have life. You have your career. You have your marriage. You have your children. You have your grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, some people. You have your education you're worrying about. You have your finances, your health. All these things go on, and, and we get complicated, and we need a reset, because we're not working out of the full power that God has given us. You know, one thing I want our church to be characterized as a church, we have beautiful building, there's no doubt. The building is gorgeous, and we have plans for what God wants to do is going to be even better. But it's not about a building. And we have great worship, and the worship was fantastic. Guys, great job. I was blown away at the level of worship today. I felt like I was... I don't know. Like I was, I think it's the best worship experience I've ever had was today. And so I expected the presence of God when I walked in and I felt the presence of God. And thank you for ushering us to the presence of God. But it's not about the worship music. It's not about the building. I believe what I want our church to be known for is changed lives. Two words, changed lives. You come in one way, you leave another. It doesn't matter if you've been a follower of Christ your whole life or if you, you're, you're kicking the tires and you're just finding out about this Jesus, it doesn't matter. We believe that if we want to be known in the community, if you want somewhere to go to get your life changed, you come to Connection Point Church. And that's what I want to be known for. Um, so how do we help you hit the reset button? The reset would be like to make fresh, a new start, to begin again. One of the words that is... is, is uh, Transferring, uh, moving through my mind is the word trans, uh, transformation. And transformation has different words or synonyms that we would use for it, like salvation. Like when I become saved, I cross the line where I say it was, I was in the kingdom of darkness and now I'm in the kingdom of light. I've crossed a line. And maybe the word sanctification. Now that I'm a Christian, I'm growing in maturity. That's what sanctification means. I'm, I'm growing which means that if I've been a believer for more than five minutes, I should be closer to God in my character, in my actions, in my words, in my thoughts. 
And that's called sanctification. It's the growing part. And so maybe you need a, a transformation in that part of your life. Another word is a, a, a conversion, like a fresh start. You've been serving God for a while and you have too many things going through your mind and you just need a fresh start. You need a reset. You need that today. There are tons of verses in the Bible that talk about this and uh, how, how God wants to give us a fresh start. And you'll find them on the screen in your handouts. And this is from Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 22. You've learned the truth that is in Jesus. So in regard to your former way of life, put off your old self and be made new in the attitudes of your mind and put on your, say it with me, new self, created to be like God, truly good and holy. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to give your word here today. Lord, I pray against uh, any confusion that's going on. I pray for your power to show up here like never before. Spirit of God, have your way in this room, in our hearts, in our lives. God, not just with words, but God, with our actions. We still ourselves. We still, we've become calm on the inside. Let peace reign in your bodies, friends, as the King of Kings walks through the, this room. Give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you feel that shift in the atmosphere when the prayer happened? I did. I did. I, I know the king, Jesus, is here. He promised he would be. He said, when two or three are gathered in my name, that I'm right there with you. And so he's here in the room. I felt it before the service started. We have prayer. If you want to come for prayer, we start at uh, uh, 9.15 to 9.30. We just pray throughout the, the room in here. And I felt the presence of God strong in here. And I knew that God was going to work in our lives so that we'd have a transformation experience. And that's what I think God wants to do in our hearts. Paul, in that, what I just read, he says, I want you to take off your stinking clothing and put on new clothes. You ever been out working in the yard or, <laughs> Lord knows I don't exercise, but you know, let's say you go to the gym and you get sweaty and you come back and you don't want to walk around in your dirty clothes. You want to change out of your clothes and put on new clothes, yeah? And when you do that, that's what the Paul is saying. He's saying the way you used to live is that old, dirty, stinky, sweaty, gross self. I remember when I was in the Army, we used to have, like, uh, field exercises. And we'd come back in to garrison or back home. And then we'd come home and we'd be in our, our we call them BDUs, battle dress uniforms. They were our, our camos. And we'd come and we would stink, because you're out in the middle of nowhere and you just, you, there's not showers. I mean, you're, you stink. And my wife wouldn't let me in the house. I had to totally declothe in the, if that's a word, take off my clothes in the garage before she let me into the house. Because I was that stinky. And when I read this verse and it talks about taking away the old self and putting on the new, that's what I think about. That stinky that my wife wouldn't even want in the house. Go take a bath take a shower, and come back, and all of a sudden, she wants to see me. Well, it's the same thing. I think that when we come before God, we come dirty and wretched and poor and blind and covered in mess, and we go, hey, here I am. He goes, cool, well, let me take that off for you, and let's put this one on. God wants to do that kind of change in your life. So I believe that God wants you to press the reset button. And I'm, the reason that I'm, I'm just taking my time into this is because back in July, I had a spiritual retreat where I went and, and just sought the Lord, God, give me direction for our church. I do this every year. And this last year it was, um, I went to St. Pete and I was just praying before the Lord. And the, like it was day three of a three day. I'm like, God, I still don't have anything. Um, you know, praying and fasting and I don't have anything from you. And he said, he quoted this verse, I'm gonna read it to you from Isaiah 43. Uh, 43, starting in verse 18, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I believe that God wants to do a new thing in our church. Last year, I stood up on the beginning of 21 days of prayer, and I said, the Lord gave me a message for our church that it's gonna be a suddenly season. And during that 21 days of prayer, like we're starting today, 21 days of prayer starts today, God did something suddenly at our, at our church. Craig 
over here. Raise your hand, Craig. Everybody knows. Craig is the principal over at uh, um, Freedom Christian Academy. And he said, listen, we're looking for a place to meet. Do you happen to have the ability to? And I said, absolutely we can. And now we have 200 kids meet here at the church Monday through Friday. We're, 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 we're help teaching the next generation from pre-K all the way to, to high school. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? It was a suddenly season. It met their needs. They were looking for a place to meet, and we were looking to help reach the next generation. And so because of that, man, God just really brought it together in a suddenly season. So last year was suddenly, and this year I'm, I believe that God wants us to forget the former things and to press on to the new stuff. You know, we were, uh, I say a church plant. We planted the church over four years ago, but I think we're out of the church plant phase. I think we're now into regular church phase. Amen. So we need to forget the former things, what's behind us, and we need to press forward to what God has. We're not just like, hey, we're new, we're going to figure this out. No, we are moving with the power of God through this place and in this area. There are 150,000 people in a 10-mile radius of this church who do not know Jesus Christ. 150,000 people. And I'm praying that God gives us the ability, the influence, and the affluence to touch people's, and cha- people's lives, to change them for the kingdom of God. The Spirit of God goes ahead of us and makes the way. Amen? And we're going to have a change in our area. I want revival to take place here in this church, in this area, in Fruitland Park. I want people to say, Fruitland Park? I never even heard of Fruitland Park. Yeah, you don't have to hear about Fruitland Park. Let me talk to you about Jesus because he's the one who changes everything. I believe it's going to happen in Jesus' name. There's a new thing that's coming. He's bringing a new thing. And people say, well, well Pastor, uh, uh, that's cool for the church, but what about me? Because let's be honest, we always start with me, right? I'm with me all the time, so what's in it for me? What's in it for me is a life that touches other people's lives. You will find no more joy and no more satisfaction in your life than when you are able to pour your life into somebody else and you see their lives changed. There is no other change that you're ever going to see. And so instead of, think about this, I I don't want to take a poll, but for those who are over 50 years old, we start thinking differently than when we were under 50. We start thinking about legacy, about what am I going to leave behind? What are people going to, what can I do to change other people? What's going to happen when I'm gone because To be honest, we don't have that much time on our spectrum. We don't know how long it is, but it's a whole lot less than it was when we were 20. And so, man, I don't know how much time I have left, but I want it to count for something. I don't want to be stuck in the the same thing, doing the same rinse, wash, repeat, rinse, rinse, wash, repeat the whole time. I want God to change me. If I'm talking to you, I want to let you know this message is for you. God wants to transform you. He wants to reset. It's going to take a reset in your life. So four preparation steps. Number one, I need to start asking God to do something new in me. I need to start asking God to do something new in me. The Holy Spirit's a gentleman. Not going to push into your life. Nobody's ever said I was, uh, I was spirit-possessed with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Demon possessed you here, right? But you don't hear, oh, the Holy Spirit possessed me. No, no, no. That's not how God works. He, he, he gives us free will. And we ask him. And the Bible says we don't have because we don't ask. And so I'm asking God to do something new in me. And I'm asking God to do something new in you. I'm praying that this next year will be the best year of your life. That places where there were, there were uh, wastelands, the water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland, God wants to do that in your life. I'm praying those places that have dried up, there may be relationships between you and your kids, maybe relationships between your neighbor, maybe relationships, maybe it's a financial thing that has dried up. I'm praying that God will do something new and transform your lives. Amen. And so you have to ask for it. You know, the difference between a a kid, when I go to, um, when I, little kids, now they're, they're grown kids, but if at Christmas time, they would like make their list. And I could tell if they really, really wanted it by how many times they asked for it. Because one would be a whim and the other one would be a wish. The one would be, oh yeah. So my youngest son, he, he had these things, 
back in the day called Bucky Balls. And they were like these magnetic balls. They would connect and you can make stuff. Anybody ever have Bucky Balls? Anybody? Okay, they were also great for throwing at each other, almost like BBs. And, uh, but I could tell that he wanted those really bad because he would not stop talking about them. So people say, well, I have to ask God? Is it okay to ask God? Isn't he busy with all the other stuff in the world, with everybody starving and, and all the bad stuff going on? Don't you think God is too busy? Why would he want to hear my prayer? God is not too busy for you. He has told you that you are supposed to ask in the name of Jesus. He says, up to now you haven't asked anything, but if you ask in my name, it will be done to you. Guys, isn't that cool? So God, give me a transformation. Make me new. Revelation 21, verse 5, this is what Jesus said. I am making everything new. That's what he does. He's in the new business. Could you imagine what a new you would be like? So m many of us, we've had some setbacks in our life. We've had some hurts. We've had some things that just weren't fair. Stuff happened. It hey, wouldn't it be great instead of dwelling on those former things, to press a reset button as if it never happened. And then, like, you don't have to dwell on those things. You don't have to have those thoughts in your mind. I believe by the power of the Holy Spirit, that can happen in Jesus' name. Think about David in Psalm 51. He prayed this. I'm going to read it from the message uh, paraphrase. God, make a fresh start in me. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. I like that. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. Now, this is written by David after stealing a man's, man's wife and then having that husband murdered. And he says, listen, God, shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. The Genesis, God made everything new. He created the world. And he's saying, I want that kind of fresh start in my, my life. Well, I don't know about that, Pastor. I, I, might, I have too much baggage. I have too much sin. I have too much regret. I, have, I messed up too bad. You don't know how bad it was. I don't care how bad it is. I know that he can take care of your issue. It doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter who you did it with. It didn't matter how long you did it. You have a God who wants to give you a fresh start. Amen? Listen, your past is your past. And you might be a product of your past, but you don't have to be a prisoner of your past. You can tweet that out, hashtag Pastor Jerry. <laughs> you are, might be a product of your past, but you don't have to be a prisoner of your past. I am here because of the decisions that I've made and things that people have done to me and through me and for, right? And I'm here because of all those decisions. But I don't have to be a prisoner of the pain. God can actually use that pain and change me. Here's what God says about the past, and I read it earlier in Isaiah 43. Forget the former things, don't dwell on the past. Look at the new things I'm going to do. They're already starting to happen. Can you see what I've begun to do? Can you see it? Anybody here a candidate for a fresh start? Anybody a candidate? Okay, put your hands up real high. Awesome. In the name of Jesus, Father, every hand that's lifted up, I pray even right now you start restoring and renewing them by your power. God, I ask it by the authority given to me by the power of Jesus Christ that you start right now renewing, refreshing, and restoring their lives, and they will never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. That's how you ask. That's how you ask, and it will be given to you. So stop looking in the rearview mirror. Forget about your past. If you live your life looking in the rearview mirror, you're going to wreck your life. I've said it often. That's why the, the front... Your, your, your windshield is so big and your rearview mirror is so small. You're supposed to look to see what God wants to do out of your life. Because I believe, get this, the rest of your life will be the best of your life. The rest of your life, hashtag Jerry Rums. The, <laughs> these are good one-liners. The Bible says in James 4, this is James, the brother of Jesus. You don't have because you don't ask. So if you want God to do a new thing in you, all you have to do is ask. Number two, I want you to pinpoint specifically what I want changed in me. 
pinpoint specifically what I want changed in me. Why? Because nothing becomes transforming until it becomes specific. Hashtag. Jerry, I'm telling you, man. <laughs> nothing becomes transforming until it becomes specific. We need to get very specific with God of what we want to do. The more specific, the faster the change will happen. If you say, God, I just want to be a new me, okay, that's good. But if you say, God, listen, look at all these things. Where do I need a reset? Do you see that in your notes? My connection to God. Maybe you need a new connection to God. Maybe in your body, your health needs a reset. Maybe your priorities need a reset. Maybe a relationship needs a reset. Maybe your energy level needs a reset. Maybe your job or your career needs a reset. Maybe my thought life needs a reset. Maybe my marriage needs a reset. Maybe my routine needs a reset. Maybe my habits need to be reset. Maybe my parenting needs to be reset. Maybe my schedule and my time needs to be reset. Maybe my confidence needs to be reset. Maybe my finances need to be reset. And finally, maybe my dream needs to be reset. Now, I, wanna, I want you on your papers that we handed out, I want you to mark on there which one or ones you need reset. I just listed a bunch of them. Just which one or ones do you need reset? And then I want to talk to just a, a small group of people. And these are the people who say that they don't have any issue with any of these. I would say the heart is deceptively wicked. And if you do not think that you have issues that can change, then you are being deceived. We all have areas where we need God to reset. This is why it applies to everyone in this room. And so if you think, oh, I'm good, I don't need it, I'm good, Pastor. Eh, I'm telling you, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Because it's going to be dangerous if you don't. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 13. Look closely at yourselves. Test yourselves to see if you're really living in the faith. Look inside, where do you need the reset? Did you write it down yet? Did you put it down on your paper? Do you know what it is? Do you have it in the back, the front of your mind? Is it like right there? If I was to call on you, you'd raise your hand and be like, I know what it is. I'm not gonna do that, by the way. Everybody's like, heart, just, oh dear God, don't do that. Romans 12, 13, verse three says, uh, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but decide who you really are by the amount of faith God has given you. God's gonna give you faith. Don't think of yourself better. My friend, don't think of yourself worse, worse either. Who has God called you to be and live by that measure of faith? You got it? Pinpoint it. Number, number three, find people to support my reset. I need to find people to, re, to support my reset. God wired us so we don't get better, we won't get healthy, we won't get whole, we won't get healed until we get other people in our lives. That's why small groups are super, super important. To be fair, I'd like to launch another 10 small groups this next, another 10. We have that many people who need to be in a small group. And that's why we're having next Sunday, after service, the small group leadership. We need you in a small group. You need to be, I, I'm begging you, begging you, get in a small group. It will change your life. I remember hearing that from a pulpit I was at a church, I had pastored, I'm like, I don't want to do a small group. I don't really care about other people. I'm like, my life is messy enough, I don't want to have to figure out your mess too. But you know what happened? I got involved in a small group, and I realized that, man, my mess isn't nearly as bad as his mess is. <laughs> and I was able to help minister to somebody who had been through something that I had been through. And like I said earlier, when you are able to pour yourself into somebody else, all of a sudden you feel a big life change happening. And so I want to invite you, be in, don't think of yourself like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to let somebody in my life. Listen, it will change your life forever. It really, really will. It might just save your life, period. Next week, people say, well, what do, what do I have to do to, be, to lead a small group? Um, you have to have either a place that you can meet, like your home or a coffee shop or a business or a park or a golf course or a pickleball place. What do you call them, pickleball court, right? 
or a pitch for soccer, my soccer guys. Um, whatever it is, God, you have to find a place. You can, as long as you can get a place, we're going to let you do it. We're going to teach you how to do it. We're going to ask that you go through starting point, which is tonight. Starting point is the membership thing. If you haven't been a member, we want you to be a member. It's really easy. I talk for like an hour-ish, and you ask questions, and I'll answer the questions there. And you'll find out what the DNA is of the church because we want you to know what that is before you start, like, doing small groups in the church. But the DNA, we want you to be a part of it, and we'll, we can go forward. It's going to be easy. We even have free Bible – it's not free to you. It's free um, Bible courses online that you can do, um, Bible studies. Did you know that? We actually have that available. And so we want to give those to you. You can pick whatever you want to do. We just ask that you bring Jesus to whatever conversation. We have different kind of small groups. We have, um, uh, we have Bible study small groups. We have care small groups, like we, things you, like maybe divorce care or, or um, uh, people who've been widowed, they need to get some, some help through that. Uh, we have, uh, I call them um, infinity groups, uh, affinity groups rather, affinity groups of people who have stuff in common. Like let's say, hey, I like to golf. I wonder if I can bring Jesus to the golf course. Yes, you can, and get some guys together, and after you golf, come together and, like, do a Bible study on the patio of the country club or wherever you golf, and you'll see lives being changed. It's real easy. It's real, real easy. So be a part of that. That's next week. Get it? Good. The Bible says, why do I say that? Ecclesiastes chapter 4, it says, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. And three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. You know, when things are, when you're, when you're working together, you're stronger together. You're stronger together. Verse 10 of Ecclesiastes 4, if one person falls, another can reach out and help. But people who are alone when they fall are in real trouble. You know, we, we have plans going forward for some pastoral care ministry here at the church. But a lot of the pastoral care ministry happens in the context of small groups. Where something happens to you and you're in a small group, your small group rallies around you. I love when people are like, yeah, my small group leader came and all the people in my small group came to visit me at the hospital. I'm like, well, how come you didn't call me? We didn't need you, pastor. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I love that you're able, because every member is a minister at our church. And if you are able, if you, if you can, you're able to go and, and meet them. Listen, we're not, we are not perfect. I don't expect you to be perfect. But I think that you will feel defeated. I think you will feel like you don't have, uh, uh, like you're a failure if you don't have the right people around you. You need people to come around you and to lift you up and to say, this is the right way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold you accountable to it. Hey, I know you said you wanted to read the Bible. Hey, look. Let's join a plan together on the Bible app, and we're going to make sure that we're reading together every day. My wife and I have a plan that we're a part of every day. Just get, so you, you have accountability that you have. Because community is God's antidote to discouragement, defeat, and failure. Community, you can put that in your notes. Community is God's antidote to discouragement, defeat, and failure. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, can I get something to drink, would you mind? I, I, I just need you to go grab a water or something. Thank you. I'm getting dry mouth. It means I must be about time for me to quit or, <laughs> or get some water and reset. <laughs> Community is God's antidote for discouragement, defeat, and failure. If you feel like you're defeated, if you feel like you're in despair, if you feel like you're discouraged, when you get around other people, they're going to help you out. The right people will help you out. The wrong people will push you down. You're either going to be influenced or you're going to be an influencee. Influencer, influencee, one or the other. I need to be around people who are going to influence me for God, who are going to ask me to get stronger and not, not worse. I need to, because listen, I used to say this, to, I was a youth pastor for many, many years. I used to say this young people that said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. It's not just for student ministry though. That's for, oh man, God bless you. Thank you so much. Your, 
Your kindness is surpassed only by your good looks. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, reset. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thanks, Lori. Uh, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. But that's not just for student ministry. That's for all of our lives. The people you put into your circle, your small circle, are going to influence you one way or the other. If you have negative Nancys around you, it's going to bring you down. Don't let them be in your, the negative people, don't let them be in your small circle. Let them be a little bit further out and help bring them up. Start speaking life to them. Let them see how life can change. Jesus had 12 disciples. They had a tighter group of three, Peter, James, and John. He was influencing people that he knew were going to lead the church after he left. They led the Jerusalem council, Peter, James, and John. And so we knew that he knew that he was investing specifically into a certain small amount of people. Invest your life in a certain small amount of people. Get tied to them. Get in a small group and then figure two or three people and become accountability partners. My accountability partner is 78 years old. 78 years old. He's a retired naval aviator. Pretty cool, right? Like, and this guy, he was a sub hunter. He flew the P3 Orions and he was like hunting subs. So cool. And uh, he's the guy who asked me all the tough questions. Hey, what are you watching? How are you treating your wife? How are you handling your finances? What does your prayer time look like? What is God showing you in the word? What, are the, what, what materials are you reading outside of that? How are you growing? And I have, that, I have the ability to have a conversation with somebody because why? I want to be better next year than I am this year. And get involved. Get somebody involved in that small circle. Uh, since we're all one body in Christ, Romans 12, we belong to each other and each of us needs each other. Yes, Lord. <laughs> each of us needs each other. Physical families don't last. They grow up, they get married, they get their own families, divorce, separate, die, separate, die, whatever, they, they move out of your house. So people who invest their whole life into their kids during the time that they're in the house, you're messing up. Because when the kids move out, you have nothing between you and your spouse. You and your spouse are primary in that relationship. Your kids are secondary. Those kids are going to move out. Listen, what happens to your spiritual walk what are you modeling for them? What's the most important thing in your life? They're going to look at that. If they think it's family, now family is super important. Don't get me wrong. Two of my, I have two, two kids, and they both serve here in the ministry. So I'm not telling you something I don't know, but I'm telling you, number one was Lori and I every single time. And my walk with Jesus was number one. So we didn't do things like other people did because we thought Jesus would be more magnified by serving him in the church than doing something else. Because my kids were not my idol. God was my, my savior. You hear what I'm saying? Um, and, and that's not because I do this for a living. I, I chose to do this. I chose to because my wife could have taken them to anything else. My kids were not number one. Jesus in my life is number one always. Wife number two. Kids number three. Small group number four. Okay? Like that's good priorities. Am I saying that it's wrong to do extracurricular activities with your kids? Please don't hear me say that. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying just be aware that you can put your family in front of it. And the family doesn't last forever. The Bible says when you get to heaven, there's not going to be marrying. You're not going to have any marriage anymore, right? And so when I get to heaven, like the only thing that's really going to last are you, my spiritual family. So what family am I investing in? Do you hear what I'm saying? Nod your heads, yes. Okay, thank you. Well, that also means that I am your spiritual big brother. That I'm a big man. And you mess with the, the, the bull, you're going to get the horns. A young man uh, uh, was messing with one of the young girls, I remember once when I was a youth pastor. And I got to meet with him face to face. I prayed for forgiveness afterwards, but 
There was no uncertain terms that he was not to treat that woman, a young lady, the way that he had been treating her. That still happens today. I don't have a problem coming up to somebody and say, listen, the way you're talking to your wife, that's not cool, bro. That's not okay the way you, come on, somebody, yeah? Let a small group leader shut somebody down and say, you need to leave because you can't talk to your wife that way. And it's not in my house you're not going to. We want to be able to, listen, we're brothers and sisters, and brothers and sisters can have different conversations than other people. Have you noticed that? And so be able to, anyway. The Bible says in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, let's not give up the habit of meeting together. Instead, let's encourage one another. Let's encourage one another. I need encouragement in my life. Good job. High five. Woohoo! Have you noticed when you walk in this church, like you get greeted by like 100 people? Anybody? It's like this is the friendliest church I've ever been a part of. Like I walk in, I'm like, hey, everybody. And they're like, hey, like real loud, like a bunch of people. I love it. I, I think it's fantastic. I love when, when people encourage me. I mean, some people, they don't, they spend their whole week and they don't get a physical touch from somebody else. They don't get a high five. They don't get a fist bump. They don't get a hug. They don't give a handshake. My friend, you can get any one of those here at our church. We love you that way. Amen. We, we love you. We want to show the love of Jesus Christ to you appropriately and in a way that will change your life. Amen. And it happens when we encourage one another in small groups. Finally, number four. We need to eliminate anything unhelpful and unhealthy. Eliminate anything unhelpful or unhealthy. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, we should remove anything in our lives that would get in the way and the sin that so easily, easily holds us back. So like if you go on a new diet, any new dieters for the new year? Yeah, okay, cool. Now if you have a new diet for the new year, what you do is you have to get rid of all the junk food in your house. Otherwise, little Debbie wakes you up in the middle of the night. It's true. And so, like, maybe, like, if, if you don't want to eat bad, you want to eat good, you got to get rid of the stuff in your cabinets that are messing up your plans for the future. Well, what about if you want to have a good mental place? You want to get a good mental place. Well, maybe I need to get rid of the stuff that's causing some of the mess in my life. What about the mental junk food that I'm putting in there? That's why we do 21 days of prayer. And 21 days of prayer is prayer and fasting. Why do we do prayer and fasting? This, we do twice a year, we do 21 days of prayer. One in January and the other one in August. Why do we do them? Because we want, and the one in January is a fasting one. We say, God, I'm going to stop doing something so that I can experience more of you in something else. So what I'm going to do, so some people say, oh, I'm going I'm to eat like a liquid diet. Well, go to your doctor and make sure you can do that. Okay? Please. I decided I was going to try a 40-day fast because if Jesus did it, I want to be like Jesus. On day 23, I passed out while I was driving because I had low blood sugar. I was not a candidate to not eat. <laughs> and so I've been blessing the Lord ever since, you know. <laughs> but maybe it's, um, maybe it's cutting out sodas out of your life. Maybe it's, for me this year, it's going to be cutting out social media for 21 days because I realize that it's, a, it's, a, it's mental junk food. And it's, I'm looking for my dopamine hits every time I look at it because I want to feel, oh, what's going on? Oh, did they like it? Did who like my post? Oh, that's so awesome. They like my post. How many likes can I get on this one? Like, get out of here. Who cares, right? And so for me, for 21 days, you're not going to hear me on social media um, because to me, it's mental junk food and I need to rid myself of that. When you look at your phone, if you have an iPhone, it will tell you how much time you spend on each app. Look at which app you're spending the most time on and say, is that making me closer to God or further from God? And then get rid of it. For social media, you know, the highest rate of depression right now ever in the history of since we've been looking at it is in now in the age of the 20-year-olds, the young adults. They're also the largest consumers of social media content. Do you think there's a correlation? I absolutely do. Because we're looking at the best of everybody, you're not seeing the worst. And so you're trying to be somebody's best, and it's all fake. 
And so what we're trying to, I'm, gonna, I'm divesting myself from that this year so that I can experience more of God in my life. I want to hear his voice more than somebody else's voice. Amen. I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't care what anybody else has to say. So maybe that's social media. Maybe for you it's alcohol. You need to stop that for a while. Or maybe it's food. You need to stop that for a while. Or maybe it's the Daniel diet. You need to eat uh, like no meats. You need to go away from that and, and, and no grains. Just look at, look at the Bible, what, what Daniel did. Hebrews 12 says this. We must get rid of everything that slows down our progress, especially the sin that was, won't let us go. <laughs> yeah? Uh, we must be determined to run the race that is ahead of us, and we must keep our eyes on Jesus who leads us. So here's a question. What do I need to get rid of or let go of in order to get the new me? Ask yourself that question. What do I need to let go of or get rid of in order to prepare for the new me? God has a lot of new things he wants to do in your life, and until we let go of it, we're not going to experience everything that God wants the word reset's only used once in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and it's used in the book of Isaiah. Now, let me give you just a history of what happened in Isaiah, and we're coming to a close, so bear with me. The nation of Israel had been beaten by a war by the empire of Babylon, and when they won the war, they took the whole entire nation prisoner and went back to Babylon with them, which is now modern-day Iraq. So the entire nation was transported from living in Israel to living in Iraq. They all moved there, and they were prisoner of war for 70 years. That's pretty discouraging, isn't it? They're like the Ukrainians in Poland right now. And this was the escaping. It wasn't just escaping. They were taken hostage. And it was said that they destroyed the capital, the Babylonians, destroyed the holy city of David, Jerusalem. So God's people are totally discouraged. In the midst of all of this, God did not want them to, God wanted, did not want them to realize or to think that God had forgotten them. He loved them, and he's going to rebuild and reset their lives. With that as a backdrop, Isaiah says this in Isaiah 54. The mountains may shake and the hills may crumble, but my unfailing love for you, that's God's unfailing love for you, will never be shaken. And God's promise of peace will never change, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. O Jerusalem, you suffering, storm-ravaged, city-needing comfort, I will rebuild you with priceless jewels, and I will reset your foundations with sapphires. What he's saying is I, God has not forgotten you. He's never stopped loving you. And God's going to rebuild the house. Why did he say he was going to use sapphires and rubies? Because sapphires and rubies don't rust and they don't decay. And they're more precious, meaning they're not as available as diamonds. God says, I, when I rebuild you, I'm going to put you on the right foundation. I'm going to, you're valuable to me. You're super valuable. Here today, the Lord say to you that you are valuable to him. And he wants to reset your life on the right foundation. That's why in Job 11, it says, put your heart right, reach out to God and get rid of evil and wrong from your home. Then face the world again, firm and courageous. Then all your troubles will fade from your memory like floods that are past and remembered no more. Your life will be brighter than the noonday sun and you will live secure and full of hope. That's good news, isn't it? Especially if you've crossed that line and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm going to forget the past. I'm going to move forward to the th forward. And for a majority of the people in here, you are Christ followers. You've said yes to God. You're following him. You said, yes, I love him. I'm serving God. I'm a follower of Christ. But some in this room have not. And this next verse is for you. When someone becomes a new Christian, 2 Corinthians, when someone becomes a new Christian, he becomes a brand new person on the inside. He's not the same as he was before. A new life has begun. So will you stand with me as we go to a time of prayer? I'm going to pray for the reset for everybody in the life, and then I'm going to pray for those who want to accept Christ to cross that line. Let's pray together. 
when, you, when I pray, I want you to pray along like in, on the inside with me. Pray something like, God, I want you to do something new in me starting today. I'm asking you to do something new in me, everything new. God, make a fresh start in me. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. He told me to forget the former things and to focus on the new things you're gonna do in me. I want you to do that. Then I want you to say, Lord, help me spend some time this week pinpointing specifically what I want changed in me, to look closely at myself, to test myself, to find out what you want to change in me. And then, Lord, I'm asking you to help me find some people to support my reset. I know that standing alone is not going to work and that I need a group of support. But I commit to getting in some kind of group this week as we reset my life. Help me to remember that when I get discouraged and when I defeated, and I feel like a failure, it's because I'm not in community. And Lord, it's easy to give up the habit of meeting together. But I commit to being in church every week and being in a small group because I know that's where I'm gonna be finding the encouragement that I need. And finally, Lord, help me to eliminate anything that's unhelpful, unhealthy in my life. And this week, help me to think through what I need to get rid of, what I need to let go of as you prepare me for the new me, the new improved me. I want you to reset my life. And if you've never asked Jesus into your life, I want you to say something like this. Jesus, come into my life. Make yourself real to me. I'm opening my heart to you. As much as I know how to do, I'm asking you to come in and to save me. And I humbly ask that in Jesus' name.